What's up guys, this is Heiss. We're here in Golden, Colorado at the Colorado Railroad Museum to talk about the museum's newest piece of equipment. And that piece of equipment is none other than Denver and Rio Grande Western number 5401, the tunnel motor. Those coming to a railroad museum with no context for what this locomotive is, it's certainly a big and impressive diesel locomotive. And it looks like it's seen its fair share of service, still sporting its original Rio Grande paint job. This locomotive is only from 1980 though, and it's one of the most common types of diesel locomotives out there with a bit of a twist. 5401 is what we call an SD40-2. But rather than being just a normal SD40-2, it's an SD40T-2. And that alludes to what I said earlier, the tunnel motor. So what makes it a tunnel motor and why is that important? And why did they need a tunnel motor anyways? Well, the Rio Grande has an alignment that is now owned by the Union Pacific that involves the Moffett Tunnel out west out of Denver. It's the second longest tunnel in the United States. It's shorter than Cascade Tunnel, the Stevens Pass Tunnel up in my home state of Washington. I always love to uh, brag to my Colorado and friends of that fact. But the Moffett Tunnel's on a pretty serious grade. The whole subdivision's pretty hilly. As such, the locomotives are working pretty hard to get up and over that alignment. So you get a big diesel locomotive, an enclosed space, trying to cool itself off while breathing its own engine fumes, it works about like you trying to breathe your own fumes in an enclosed space. Not, not very good. Uh, just like uh, you, the engine will shut down. The Rio Grande came up with a modification to the standard SD40 that made it the T, the tunnel motor, that helped with this sort of problem that they were experiencing. Those of you familiar with the lineage of these older EMD diesel locomotives, even though 1980 is not that old in the grand scheme of things, you may know that these locomotives have a pretty old design of engine in them. They have the 645 engine in them. And the 645 is really just a bigger version of the 567, which was a concept as early as the 1930s. Big V16 two-stroke diesel engine. Very stupid, very low tech, very slow speed. The engine knows how to shut down if it's got hot oil? Well, the answer to that's very simple. Let's take a look. So at the front of the engine and the back of the locomotive, because EMDs are strange, we have the governor. This is actually what sets the engine's speed via the fuel rack right here. So it's mechanically fuel injected based on what the throttle tells the governor to do. It will tell the engine to do via these linkages here. The governor has this little button on it though. That little guy right there. That button is the root of all evil. Anyone who's ever worked in a big railroad shop or worked on these locomotives and has had challenges with governor buttons popping out knows what I mean. That thing pops out and trips and shuts down the engine at a sneeze of a problem with the engine oil. If the engine oil gets low, doesn't have enough pressure, that pops out, shuts down the engine. Engine oil gets hot, it's not viscous enough. Same kind of thing as the oil being too low. That button kicks out, no more fuel, engine shuts down. Pretty simple tech, but it's been around for a long time. We also have an engine protection device that also helps shut down the engine via that same button, via low water or a crankcase overpressure condition. You do not want crankcase overpressure. That's how you send pistons to space. So now we know kind of the why they needed a tunnel motor and how the problem was affecting them. So how'd they fix it? Well, the answer is the back end of this car body here. Let's go take a look. If you're familiar with the normal SD40-2, you'll note that it kind of has a defining feature of a big platform on that end, a big platform on that end. You'll note that this doesn't have that. It's the same wheelbase, the same trucks, fuel tank, all that. For me, below, pretty much an SD40-2. From there forward, it's pretty much an SD40-2, but this chunk of engine back is very unique, very different, 
and it's all about keeping the new incoming cooling air extra cold. How'd they do that? Well, the first thing is big cold air intake where there is nothing else. This intake mounted down low is huge. It's a lot taller, a bit longer than the standard intake on other diesel locomotives and the normal ones on other diesels are normally mounted up there. Heat rises, so this is the coolest place they can get that cold air above the frame into the car body. But it's not just the bigger intake down low that seals the deal. Inside this rearmost compartment, we have the air compressor for the locomotive. It's a very standard air compressor for an EMD diesel engine. It's connected via shaft to the engine, so it's actually powered all the time by the crankshaft of the engine. And when it doesn't need to pump, it has special devices called unloaders that stop the pistons from compressing. Which is an interesting solution, but rather than having a separate power unit or an extra system to run the air, just tie it into the engine. Made sense at the time. Normally, on a normal diesel locomotive, and maybe diesel mechanics are going, what the heck? This is normally underneath the radiators in the air compressor room at the back of the car body. And then we still have that whole intake section behind us. They built a bulkhead, a firewall, a heat shield, all the way in behind the air compressor. And it's even angled. And there you can see the water send in return from the radiators up above us coming back. This means that all the heat developed by this massive 645 16-cylinder diesel engine, that's 645 because it's 645 cubic inches per cylinder, giant diesel engine. All the heat created there, the exhaust, the turbo, the air compressor, all that madness is separated from this cold air intake, whereas normally it's all connected. Additionally, the radiator fan is different as well. We pop open these body latches here. You can look and see inside here that the radiator fans are huge and there's only two of them. There's one in this compartment and one in that compartment. That means that you've got more cooling power and more cooling power all the time. A normal locomotive like this normally has three fans, but this only has two, and they're usually smaller and mounted on the roof. Additionally, you can see up top that the radiators are mounted parallel with the roof line, exposing the largest cross section to this huge flow of cool, separated from heat air. On a normal EMD diesel locomotive, those radiators are mounted pretty much vertically up top against the side walls right next to that intake so that it goes straight from intake straight through the radiator and the fans are on the backside. But this way, you're directly forcing a ton of fresh, cool air up through those radiators, keeping this thing as cold as possible. The Rio Grande had a large number of these locomotives and they ended up working for the Southern Pacific after the two railroads merged. So you may have seen them in either livery and some were SD40s and some were SD45s with a 20 cylinder engine instead of 16. You know what happens when you let Heist talk about railroad history without letting anyone else vet it? You usually get stuff wrong. Here's a little correction for you. Either way, these locomotives are really cool and they helped railroading out in a very unique circumstance here in Colorado. So what about in modern day? Moffat Tunnel has not gotten any shorter or any less steep than it was back in the day. Why don't we see tunnel motors anymore? Well, simply put, the locomotives got more modern. The SD40 was one of the last series of locomotives that had entirely mechanical control going on of the actual fuel delivery and the engine's performance. EMD locomotives starting with the SD60s and GE locomotives like the Dash 9 and newer have electronic load control, where if they sense the engine's heating up too much, they can actually back off the amount of load and thus the amount of work the engine's trying to do to prevent the engine from having to shut down. They can limp along rather than totally shut down in that very mechanically governed way of the SD40. As such, the locomotives will provide less power, but it's simply a case of more horsepower now solves the problem. That's another piece of this puzzle. The new locomotives that are run in road service are more powerful too. The SD40 and the SD40T-2 were designed with about 3,000 horsepower in operation. Modern locomotives tend to be 4,400 or 4,500 horsepower. So the extra power means fewer locomotives are needed even when they're derating themselves. 
Anyways, guys, I hope you liked this look at what makes a tunnel motor a tunnel motor. It's a really cool locomotive and one that I hope someday we can make run again. It's only been out of service for close to 15 years. It's fine. It looks pretty solid. It looks better than some of the power I've seen coming on the railroad. It can't be that hard, right? Let me know if you'd like to see a Loco 360 episode on this locomotive as well. I started that series and we did 491, going through everything on it that you possibly can, all the valves, all the controls, all the different locations, trying to explain as much as we can in one video. And even then it was still a 40, 45 minute video. We still didn't cover everything, but if you'd like to see that on one of these locomotives, like 5401, which is essentially a complete diesel locomotive with all kinds of goodies, let me know. I'd love to do it. It'd be a fun one to film. Thanks so much for watching, guys. We will catch you all next time.